This video will cover part one for subtopic 5.3, classification of biodiversity. In this video, here are the list of understandings that we will cover. In part two, we will cover applications related to 5.3. So we'll start with a basic question. So what do the following names all have in common? So you have the name Mithrander, Greybeard, the White Rider, Stormcrow, Graham, Barcoon. What do all these names have in common? So if you want, Google the answer, think about it, or if you know the answer, you know, say it to yourself, or just wait for me to give you the answer. So what these names all have in common is that they are all names for Gandalf, a character found from the Lord of the Rings series. If you've ever read these books, you know that based on the region that he's in, he goes by different names. And if you're not aware that these different names can exist, it can be a bit confusing about who is being referred to in the book. So what if scientists named plants and animals in a similar fashion? You know, it could certainly uh, create confusion as well. So there is um, a, a system that is used, referred to as the binomial system, to help identify uh, species. So biological classification will attempt to arrange living organisms into groups that enable them to be identified easily and that will show evolutionary links between them. So there are four main reasons why organisms need to be classified and uh, be given a, a particular name or a specific name. So it helps impose order and organization on our knowledge. Um, you know, we always look for trends and patterns and given the great uh, amount of species that are out there, it helps uh, create some order amongst the chaos. And it allows um, each species to be given a unique and universal name, which has benefits to it, which we'll talk about. It will help to identify evolutionary relationships, which we'll talk about as well, and to help predict characteristics to allow for identification, which we'll get into a little bit as well. So with the use of the binomial system to help identify uh, species, um, keep in mind, like I said, the name, the same species can have uh, many different local names. So based on the fact that you have these different local names, it does not allow observers uh, to be confident that they are talking about the same organism. So, for example, the name magpie can represent entirely different birds commonly seen in Europe, Asia, and in Sri Lanka. And these birds are shown in these pictures here. So you have the European magpie, the Asian magpie, and the Sri Lankan magpie. All very different birds, but with similar names, um, or a similar common uh, name, or a similar local name. And so this can create fusion of it, confusion about which uh, particular species is being discussed. So to allow for international collaboration and science is an international venture, um, you know, a classification system has been developed. So using this system, everyone everywhere can know exactly which organism is being referred to. So given that science is an international venture, um, these scientific names are needed so that they can be understood throughout the world. So this modern system of naming species was developed uh, by an individual uh, by the name of Carl Linnaeus in 1735. Um, and by creating this modern system of naming, he also uh, founded um, modern taxonomy. And when we talk about taxonomy, this is the science of identifying, naming, and grouping organisms. In Linnaeus's uh, system of naming species, he gave each organism two Latin names, hence binomial, so by meaning two, um, nomial meaning uh, naming you know, system, so a two naming system. So the first part of the name is going to be the genus name, and the second part is going to be a species name. And we'll get into more detail about uh, what that means. Um, so. Carl Linnaeus originally published uh, his work, the Systema Natura, in 1758, in which he gave binomials for all species known at the time. So his naming system, he applied them to all known species at the time, which did not include bacteria. 
Um, today, there are hundreds of specialists who describe and name species. So the number of new species that have been discovered since 1758 has increased exponentially. And so um, there has to be um, universal kind of agreement on the conventions applied to naming and universal agreement about the names that are being used. So every four years, experts will come together um, to share and discuss findings, which include uh, the topic of uh, classification. So there is the International Congress of Zoology, which deals with the classification of animals, while the International Botanical Congress deals with the classification of plants. So both the IBC and ICZ oversee the international efforts to maintain consistent naming conventions and use of taxon. So there are three main um, objectives to using binomial nomenclature and its associated uh, rules. So it will ensure that each organism has a unique name that cannot be confused with another organism. And it ensures that names can be universally understood. And one of the main parts of it, using a binomial system and having these conventions that agree to these uh, rules is that names of organisms cannot be changed without a valid uh, reason. And it also ensures kind of um, agreement on how organisms are, are named. Um, so um, back um, in the early days when this system was uh, adopted, there weren't very many rules about naming. And so when somebody identified a species, they kind of had free reign to at least uh, name the species part of, of the organism. And often uh, times, if it was an organism, you know, that was undesirable or had uh, undesirable uh, traits or characteristics, they would usually name, um, the person who discovered the species would usually name them after people they didn't like or um, their rivals in the field um, as, a, as a form of kind of, um, um, insulting them. But um, these rules, um, you know, there, there's very strict rules around naming and you, you can't name organisms or species after people you don't like anymore. So in the use of a binomial uh, system to identify species, as I mentioned before, species are named by um, the use of a genus uh, name and then a species name. So when we talk about a genus, we're talking here about a group of species that share certain characteristics. Um, you know, those characteristics are usually observable uh, characteristics and can range from a lot of different uh, features. But when we talk about a species now, a species um, specifically refers to a group of organisms which can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So every organism is assigned uh, to names um, and the use of those names can help um, uh, identify that uh, organism. So for example, we have the name uh, Ursus uh, maritimus, um, which refers to uh, polar bears. So when you use this particular uh, Latin name, you know, it indicates polar bears. So there are rules when using uh, binomial nomenclature. So the genus name um, has to start with um, an uppercase letter and the species name has to start with a lowercase letter. For typed text, um, that typed text um, has to be done in italics. And if it is printed uh, text, then it has to be underlined. So the name can be abbreviated after the first use in a text to the initial letter um, of the genus name and the full uh, name of the species. So you don't always have to write out the full genus name and species name. It can be abbreviated after the first use. So the binomial system can also be used to identify closely related species. And so, um, you know, you can use that genus part of the name to identify species that are closely related. So obviously, you know, if, um, if, if the genus name is uh, similar, then, you know, those species are going to be closely related that, than uh, species who have a different genus name. So in the following example here, you know, we have um, some pictures of sharks along with their uh, scientific names. You have the black tip reef shark, white tip reef shark, and Caribbean uh, reef shark. 
So the question is, which two species of shark are mo most closely uh, related? And so obviously it's going to be the two species that have the similar uh, genus name. That similar genus names means that they do have characteristics in common, um, whereas the other uh, species of shark um, has uh, features or characteristics that are not uh, that related to the other two types of sharks here. In the naming system, subspecies are also recognized. So subspecies um, are, are species that can still interbreed to produce fertile offspring, um, but do not because of geological barriers. And so here in this example, um, we have the Bengal tiger and the Siberian tiger. And so the scientific name of the Bengal tiger, the Panthera tigris tigris, identifies that this is a particular uh, subspecies um, of, of tiger, whereas um, the Siberian tiger, which is Panthera tigris al, um, alteca, um, indicates, you know, that this is uh, a, a subspecies that is different from the Bengal tiger. Now, these two tigers can still interbreed, produce fertile offspring, but because of geological barriers, you know, they do not um, interact. Now, within naming, there is a hierarchy of taxa in terms of classification. And just recall, when we talk about taxonomy, it's also, um, it's not just the practice of, of naming, but it's also the practice of uh, classification as, as well. And so um, when we look at classifications, and particularly natural classifications, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in a bit, um, natural classifications will look to group uh, together organisms with many of the same characteristics um, and can be uh, predictive. So by studying the characteristics of an organism, it is possible to predict the natural group that it belongs to. So there are many levels of classification. Um, you know, we start with very broad and we can get very uh, specific. So the most broad and all encompassing is that of the domain. Um, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. And then as we go down the levels of classification, we get more and more uh, specific. So as we move from kingdom to species, organisms share more and more characteristics. So this system will allow us to group organisms while assigning unique scientific names or unique species names. So when we look at the hierarchy of taxa and how this kind of works for getting more and more specific, We'll start down at the bottom where we have a species here, and we'll work our way up to kind of include more and more organisms. So here we have a very specific set of characteristics um, that will um, set uh, as a species. And remember, a group of a species is a group of organisms that are capable of interbreeding that will produce fertile offspring. Now, from here, we can start um, to, to group together closely related species that may be able to interbreed but do not produce fertile um, offspring. So here we get the genus level of organization here or classification where we have a group of similar and closely related species. And then from genus, um, we can start to group those together to get a family and then you know, uh, a family is going to be a group of apparently uh, related uh, genre. So here, if we look at kind of what we're starting to include, you know, at the species level, you know, we just have um, the the wolf here. And then when we get into the genus, you know, we can start to include different uh, canines. And then uh, when we get into that family, we have uh, canine-like organisms in here. So, you know, we've now included a fox in there. Um, which is not a canine, but has canine-like features. And then uh, from the family, you know, we can get into a uh, order. So an order is a group of apparently related uh, families. And so this order here is the uh, carnivora, the carnivores. So here we have a group of uh, carnivores, which, you know, include those canines, plus now um, the bears and cats. And then um, from the order, we can start to get into uh, class, which is um, a group of orders within a particular uh, phylum. 
So this class here now is uh, mammalia or the mammals. So we can start to include uh, our mammals in here um, and the ones that uh, you know do not uh, necessarily eat meat. Um, and then from the class, we can start to get into our phylum, um, which is organisms constructed on a uh, similar plan. Um, so largely speaking, like our animals can be, um, you know, divided into vertebrates and non-vertebrates, and then ver non-vertebrates can be divided into a whole other bunch of different phylums. Um, so in this particular phylum, you know, for organisms constructed on a similar plan, these animals here all have uh, a backbone um, or vertebrate, so they're grouped um, in the phylum as chordata. So anything with a backbone is now included in here um, beyond mammals, so that includes like the shark, the lionfish, the alligator, um, um, and, and the, the birds here. And then you can, from, from the phylum, you can get into the kingdom, which is the largest and most inclusive grouping. So in this uh, kingdom, these are basically anything made up of, any organism made up of animal cells, which can include, you know, spiders, coral reef, jellyfish, lobsters, butterflies, um, and bats and wolves and dogs and bears so at the top here is kind of the most um, inclusive where we have kind of the least amount of characteristics in common um, between these different uh, species and so you know we can use this level of classification to figure out how closely related different species are so in the following question you know it asks which is uh which of the following is true of these elephants and so we have these two uh species here we have elephas maximus and loxodonta africana and um the questions asked or the the uh the following which we're asked to determine which is true is that you know a they are two species in the same genus um they are two species in different genii or they are um they are from two genii in the same family or they are two subspecies um, of the same species now if you're thinking like B or C, or if you're wondering B and C as being correct, um, you know, the answer would be B and C as the correct answer here. So they are two species um, in different genii, so they have different genus names, um, but they would probably belong to that uh, same family given that, broadly speaking, they share very similar uh, characteristics as well. So um, ultimately, all organisms can be classified into three domains, and those three uh, domains or that domain is kind of um, the three major forms of life that get recognized um, and kind of look at the cellular level um, of, of organizing um, these different species. And so just note in here that viruses are not included as they are not considered living things. Um, so those three domains include the eukaryota, the archaea, um, and the eubacteria. And so, um, you know, within the eukarya, um, um, we have all those different um, uh, organisms made up of eukaryotic cells uh, from animals to plants. And you can see all the different forms in here of eukaryotic cells, and not all of them are named as well. Um, and you bacteria as well have many different forms and the archaea as well. So with those organisms being classified into the three domains, um, each of those organisms or the organisms of each domain basically will share a distinctive unique pattern of ribosomal RNA. And it's mostly um, the ribosomal RNA that's helped kind of create the differences between the domains. At one time, um, there were just the two domains. There were prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But studying um, uh, studies of those archaea uh, bacteria, those extremophile prokaryotes, showed that there were very distinct um, differences um, in those organisms compared to uh, um, 
typical prokaryotes, and it warranted um, putting them in their own domain. Archaea bacteria are more closely re re uh, related to eukaryotes than they are to eubacteria, true bacteria. And so this chart here just goes through the biochemical differences between the different domains. Um, so you can, one of, one of the big um, differences uh, here um, is that um, in terms of having protein bound um, to the DNA, um, archaea bacteria have histones uh, present in their DNA um, along with eukaryotes, and eubacteria, those prokaryotes, do not have um, protein-bound DNA. They have that naked DNA. And then one of the big biochemical differences uh, between the domains is the lipid uh, structure of the cell uh, membrane or the lipids of the cell membrane bilayer. So archaea bacteria contain um, a different um, uh, phospholipid than that found in eukaryotes and uh, prokaryotes as, as well. So one of the big differences here is that the linkage uh, between these fatty acids and glycerol is that of an ether linkage highlighted here in yellow, whereas in eukaryotes and prokaryotes, that uh, linkage that attaches those fatty acids to glycerol is an ester linkage. So very different uh, biochemistry here. One of the things that you'll be expected to do or asked to do is to be able to classify uh, one plant and one animal species from domain level down to the species level here. So um, here I've provided an example of um, an animal. So starting at the domain, both animal and plant would be eukaryota. But for the animal, um, you know, it would be within the Animalia kingdom. Um, phylum would be Chordata, class would be uh, Mammalia, um, the order would be Primates, family would be Hominidae, um, the genus would be Homo, and the species would be Sapiens. And so the common name uh, would be Human. And for the plant, um, we have, you know, the domain being the Eukaryota, the kingdom being Plantae, the phylum being Angiospermophyta, um, the class being um, um, Eudi Eudicotidae, sorry. Um, the order being Ranunculus, um, and the family being um, Ranunculaceae, and then the genus being Ranunculus, and the species being uh, Acris. And, you know, a very complex name for a, a nice flower, just simply referred to as the meadow buttercup. So, um, you know, this is something that you would be expected uh, to be able to do um, uh, for one plant and for one animal. If you don't like the animal and plant uh, provided, you know, you get to choose your own. Now, sometimes um, with this classification, because, um, you know, new species are always being discovered, new uh, techniques are being uh, developed to study differences between these different organisms, um, differences may arise that may not um, indicate that classification has been done uh, properly. So there have been changes to how classification as, has done, and we can expect more changes to come along the way as well. So early classification was limited to observable characteristics and not based on a genetic uh, connection. The consequence of this is that some organisms were put into the same genus, even though they are uh, not in fact closely related to each other. Sometimes evidence shows that members of a group do not share a common ancestor or sometimes um, re resulting in the fact that groups should be split into two or more taxa. Sometimes evidence shows that species in different taxa are more closely related, and so two or more taxa um, are, are joined together. And it depends really at the what level um, they would be joined together. Genetic studies of ribosomal RNA um, have shown that prokaryotes are far more diverse than anyone suspected. Um, and so this is how the domain of the archaea uh, came about. And so the example shown here is with hominoid uh, classification. So the traditional hominoid classification um, had the 
uh, Hamande um, um, uh, family um, and just had humans um, as the only Hamande. Um, in the Ponga Day, um, this is where uh, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans were all uh, classified uh, together. But based on um, you know molecular studies, it turns out that this classification was not accurate and needed uh, reclassification uh, again. So the Hominini group was uh, created um, to include both humans um, and the pans, um, the pan group, which included chimpanzees and bonobos. And gorillas, it turns out, aren't that closely related uh, to chimps or bonobos, so they had um, their own classification uh, redone. And same with uh, orangutans. Um, you know, they are distantly related to gorillas and chimps. Um, we are more closely related to chimps than chimps are to orangutans. And so this uh, reclassification um, was done to more accurately show kind of the um, uh, common ancestry between these different species. So when we get into classification, um, there's kind of two ways in which this can be done, which is through natural classification or artificial classification. Natural classification is what we use um, for our classification systems. So natural classification uses ancestry to group organisms together, whereas artificial classification uses arbitrary characteristics um, to, to group organisms uh, together. So this is based on uh, usefulness, for example. So grouping organisms according to natural classification offers several advantages over artificial classification, which can include trying to make sense of the biosphere, showing evolutionary links, and predicting characteristics shared by members of a group. Um, so characteristics of natural classification systems include um, using morphology, DNA, diet, or habitat to classify organisms. Artificial classification systems would include like ranking them or grouping them um, in alphabetical order, um, you know, our preference for taste or smell, um, how important they are to industry or monetary worth. These are all artificial uh, classification systems. And so in these natural classification uh, systems, you know, it will group to it will group um, together species that share a common ancestors from which they evolved. And so it is expected that members of a group share important attributes that are inherited from those uh, common uh, ancestors. So in this uh, uh, picture here, um, you know, if we have a look at uh, lions um, as uh, compared uh, with jaguars and clouded lepers, um, you know, we would expect that lions um, have more in common with jaguars, so they share more traits than they do with clouded lepers. Um, so here, you know, um, this, this branch point shows that common ancestor, and so there was a common ancestor um, to both uh, uh, lions and jaguars, so they share more traits with each other. Whereas um, you have to go back um, several common uh, ancestors to find um, a, a common ancestor between uh, clouded leopards and lions. And so um, what this natural classification shows is kind of the evolutionary links between these different species. If we were to group together birds, bats, and bees because they fly, um, this would be considered an artificial classification. Um, just because they fly doesn't mean they share a common ancestor. Um, and, you know, when we look at those evolutionary links, we see that um, they evolve that ability to fly independently. So grouping them together based on that ability to fly is considered an artificial classification. And plants and fungi were once classified uh, together because they shared characteristics such as a cell wall, but we know that's not accurate now, and so they don't get classified uh, together anymore. So with natural classification and its usefulness towards new species, um, this can be very helpful when dealing with a new species. Um, because members of a group have a common ancestor, they will share similar characteristics, and it will allow uh, prediction of characteristics of species within a group and can help identify where this new species might uh, belong.
So, for example, if a new species of ant was discovered, then scientists would predict that the species should possess six jointed legs, a head, thorax, abdomen, and elbowed antennae. If the species does not match the expected set of characteristics, this brings into question either the classification of the species or ants as a family. So, you know, there are characteristics of ants that you would expect uh, to encounter, and then um, you know, if, if the species of ant um, doesn't show all of these uh, characteristics, it might, um, um, it might call into question how uh, ants are classified as a family. So when biologists encounter a species they do not recognize, you know, they will use what is called a dichotomous key to establish which taxa um, this organism will belong to. So what is a dichotomous key? So a dichotomous key is a series of steps, each involving a decision which can be used to identify unknown organisms. The key prompts us to decide um, through yes or no answers, through careful observation, whether or not a specimen displays a particular uh, visible features and allows us to distinguish between specimens on this basis. So here, you know, if we, um, we're trying to classify this organism here, um, you know, um, we would use this following dichotomous key to help us out. So in that first question here, you know, it's asking are wings present? So, you know, wings are present. So we would go to question number two. Does it have two pairs of wings or one pair of wings? So it looks like it has two pairs of wings. So we go to question three. So does it have legs of all approximately the same length? Yeah, it kind of looks like it does. Um, so we would go to question four, and are the whales are, are the wings covered in scales, or are they transparent and not covered in scales? So they are covered in scales, and they are not transparent. So we would classify this organism as a butterfly. And then, um, you know, the, the rest of the economy's key, if we had other species we were trying to identify, could help us um, classify um, these different um, um, species or these different organisms largely speaking as butterflies, dragonflies, or spiders, or crabs, or centipedes, or prawns. So how we use a dichotomous key um, is that you have to first look at the section of the key which has a pair of sentences, A or B, or one or two, um, A or B, um, describing the characteristics. Next, look at the organism to see if the particular characteristic described in the first line A is present in the organism. If the answer is yes, then go um, to the end of its line and find the number um, of the next pair of statements to look at. So it will instruct you which um, statements to look at next. Follow the number uh, given and continue until the end. Um, if, if the end of the line contains a name, it is the taxon of the organism. If the answer is no, then go to the second statement just below it, B, and that one should be true. So go to the end of its line and find the number of the next pair of statements to look at. Follow the number uh, given and continue until the end. Keep going until you get to a name instead of a number. If you have answered each question correctly, that will be the name of the taxon your organism belongs to, and you've correctly identified the organism. So here is um, a little bit of practice. So um, use the dichotomous key below to identify the frog in the picture. And so what we will cover in class um, is how to construct uh, a, a dichotomous key, and we will do a little bit of practice making them. So this ends the video um, for part one of 5.3 classification.